good evening faculty and audience respected faculty panelists and dear friends welcome to the 8th symposium of uttaranchal orthopedic association this summer this evening we are here to listen to the all women symposium of pediatric orthopedics it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers and panelists to all of you we have our first speaker dr shobha arora a well known name in the field of pediatric orthopedics she has been professor and teacher at ucmc delhi for 25 years and then she came to uh, as a head <coughs> pediatrics as head orthopedics in the aims rishikesh and she took her retirement this year only from aims rishikesh now she is residing at guru gram and uh, we are proud to say that she is also the uh, president of north zone orthopedic association welcome you ma'am thank you so much sir thank you she will be uh, talking about the <coughs> nutritional factors in pediatric orthopedic joint infections bone and joint infections our second speaker is dr rujuta mehta from mumbai she is a well known name in the field of pediatric orthopedics she is associated with many hospitals in mumbai including the nanavati and jaslok hospital she has a special interest in pediatric orthopedics and especially in the hands so but she deals with all type of pediatric orthopedic anomalies she has been head of the bai jer bai wadia hospital for children for the last 21 years she has got 40 national and international publications she is immediate past secretary of bombay orthopedic society presently she is vice president of bombay orthopedic society and she is chairperson of the indian orthopedic association women's orthopedic surgeons forum uh, she has been long associated with the transcer orthopedic association last year and before last year also welcome madam she will Pleasure, be sir. taking the topic of uh, decision making in janu varam and janu valgas welcome madam Pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. We have got three panelists. Uh, Dr. Arti Diwan. She is professor at SGRD Medical College, Amritsar, and executive member of Punjab Orthopedic Association. Welcome, Dr. Arti. You are not visible, Dr. Arti. Welcome, madam. Please unmute yourself. We have with us Dr. Rama Priya Yasam from AIMS Rishikesh. After doing her orthopedic MS, she is now pursuing for the MCH in uh, Rishikesh. And as far as I know, she may be the first candidate for MCH. Am I right, Dr. Shobha? She is the first one. We have with us Dr. Saraswati Vishnathan from Bangalore. Uh, she is also a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and done fellowship in pediatric orthopedics. She is practicing at Bangalore. Welcome, Dr. Saraswati. Now I would request Dr. Shobha Rora to please you, share her screen. and the start of topic thank you dr siroi thank you for your kind words i am sharing my screen is my full screen visible yes ma'am good evening everybody uh 
this topic is a little different from conventional topics in pediatric orthopedics. We usually focus on the local parts like DDH, CTV, knee deformities, hand deformities, shoulder and all. But I thought it is good to have a holistic approach to the child's bone and joint infections. And this has been a topic close to my heart. Earlier also I have been speaking on this and because we have actually done this in Ames Rishikesh, uh, I have seen the results of this. So I would just like to share these ideas with you. <clears throat> the whole objective of this talk will be uh, to have a holistic approach to a child's immunity as to how are we going to deal with the bone infections uh, systematically and what helps in developing the immunity of a child? What are the clinical practical implications for a surgery? It's not just about theory and discussions and what is the practical use while you are treating a child with bone and joint infection or even elect elective surgery. Uh, we all agree that one of the most dreaded infections in childhood are the skeletal infections because they could be recurrent, they can cause lifelong disability and I'm afraid some kind of antibiotic resistance is also coming up in skeletal infections. So we have to be on our toes whenever we just suspect an infection, leave alone finding one. Now, let me take you back to a little MBBS level stuff because the immune system of a child has many components. And for us, the concern is the maternal immunity, which the child gets at birth and which lasts for a shorter time. Then the child's immune system starts developing for the acquired immunity and we have learned all that at our graduation level. And one of the most important organs in the development of immune system in a child that we forget is the bone marrow. And it is very much into the purview of pediatric orthopedics that bone marrow infections are going to be disastrous. So this has to be remembered that it's not just about sequestrum and involucrum and a deformity and a pathological fracture or a sinus. It is the whole immune system which is damaged so badly. If you have a fever in, whom, in, in a child whose marrow has been destroyed in a difficile osteomyelitis, the loss is tremendous. So this aspect I am really interested in stressing upon and that, that it should be uh, one of the, our awareness in treating infections. Now, uh, just a little word about the cellularity, because we know we are surgeons, we, we don't like too many microscopic things, we like big things and just see whatever you can do about it. But please remember that we go back out to our pathology and find out that macrophages convert themselves into dendritic cells and the dendritic cells can be further lung specific or marrow specific. This is for the pyogenic infections and for the tubercular infections, the beta B cells will be taking their own course, the lymphoid system. And uh, I'm sure many of us do not understand these slides, but they are the plain simple bone marrow slides from a child and the myeloid and the lymphoid cells that we used to see at our pathology labs. The maturation of the immature myeloid cells goes back into uh, the system in differentiating into many, many cells like dendritic cells and all basophils, monophils and everything. However, what I want to bring to the notice of surgeons is that all these cell divisions and differentiations use a very rapid glucose metabolism. And one of the papers I'll be sharing with you, um, this brings us to the key cell in the resistance of the bone to a circulating infection, which is the osteoblast and the defense the main soldier of defense of settling infection into the bone marrow is the osteoblast, which utilizes circulating glucose to the highest level. This paper, uh, 2018 paper in bone says that the uh, critical functions of glucose metabolism during osteoclast and osteoblast differentiations are having a metabolic plasticity. That means they, they can use glucose at different levels and they can adjust themselves to the circulating glucose levels. So this is very important. So when we talk of the bone immunity, there is a component of nutrition, which is a holistic component. And if I say a hungry skeleton, please don't consider this to be the vitamin D kind of thing. This is hungry in the true sense of it. Like there's a rapid use of circulating glucose by the uh, osteoblasts and the macrophages. And of course, micronutrients are also very much in use. If you say I'm talking of a hungry skeleton, why not establish the blood sugar levels in a sick child of osteomyelitis and see if there is an hypoglycemia? No, sir, I'm not talking about the circulating hypoglycemia. This is insufficient circulating glucose for the growing bone. If I may give an example, a poor man's family gets 100 rupees a day. 
they don't sleep hungry but do you think in 100 rupees a day five people can eat nutritious food it's the same way there is no dearth of sugar in the blood but the amount of sugar which is required glucose which is required for the metabolism of these cells is definitely insufficient so the plasticity that the paper talks about is that the macrophages and the osteoblasts adjust themselves to the available level of glucose <clears throat> Why this happens? Why children have this kind of immunity? And why do they have lack enough glucose for the circulating and developing immune system? In the affluent patients, children have food fats. I don't eat this. And parents, for the sake of their pampered child, okay, eat this, okay, don't eat this. They are not, they are not very diligent about looking at the nutritious diet which is given to the child and is the child accepting it or not. In poor families, of course, there is food shortage. And if it is a child of 8 to 10 years who is working also, they will definitely need more food which may not be available. Plus, the quality of the food that may be available to these people may be poor quality food. Or in the affluent families, there could be the pesticides and high quality food which has uh, preservatives and other things in it, chemicals in it. So this all leads to a persistent calorie deficit, which is not, again, I would insist, it's not hypoglycemia. Please understand, I'm not talking of hypoglycemia. Calorie deficit is different from hypoglycemia. And if you consider the special situations in pediatric orthopedics, definitely a CP child cannot be expected to eat a diet like a normal child. Immobile children do not get, do not feel, uh, do not feel like eating all good things. So children with spina bifida or other congenital anomalies where mobility is restricted since childhood may not be having the best of nutrition. So what are the implications for the surgeon? <clears throat> the implications for the surgeon are that in your elective surgeries where you are enthusiastic about correcting that DDH that came to you or you are a big spine surgeon want to do the scoliosis or a simple fracture fixation which has come to you, shaft femur or something like that. This will develop post-op deep and superficial infections, wound infections, post-op infections because your host is not prepared for these major surgeries. And definitely on the hematogenous infection side in emergency, you can get acute osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, or tubercular, disease, tubercular uh, osteomyelitis or arthritis also. And the implications in the treatment are that you do a wound care, you do a debrima, you do an implant removal, you use your best of antibiotics, meropenem, whatever you want to use. And your typical prescription includes a high protein diet. Sorry, sir. I beg to differ on this. Correct the calorie deficit. HCD, not HPD, high calorie diet. As I explained, your macrophages, patients' macrophages and the osteoblasts are, are hungry. They need sugar. They don't need protein. So what is lacking in our protocol? Number one, we are not recording the oral intake of the child. We don't ask on the rounds what has the child eaten in the whole day. Has the child taken a breakfast in the morning and what did he eat? Child has been sick since few days, since how long he has not been eating properly? And did we actually objectively calculate the calorie deficit? The extra calories which are needed for healing are also not added by us. This is a huge flaw in the management of a pediatric surgery, elective surgery or a pediatric infection which has come to you. So the new strategy of management, as I suggest, is we should allow and encourage a local healing response, all right, by, by doing all the local things that we do. But we need a systemic healing. Without that, the bones and the wounds and the tissues are not going to heal. So the major important thing that you need to do is calculate the calorie deficit, maintain a diet diary of a child. What is the diet diary? We'll tell you the deficit. A normal child, I suppose, needs X calories, 1200 calories, normally active child, otherwise healthy, nothing else is happening to a child. Any sick child, if there is a systemic illness of any kind, be, be it a medical illness or a surgical illness, it will, leave one, it will need normal plus 1.5 times calories for healing. This is the extra requirement of the calories for the healing tissues. What happens in actually sick child, this goes halfway down the even the X also. So he's just taking half the calories out of his sick mindset. He's taking just half the calories, leave alone the 1.5 times. So the deficit is 
as good as the normal diet. So he's practically not eating anything. How are you going to expect the healing of the tissues with this amount of huge calorie deficit? We actually calculated this with our nursing staff with admitted children. And we found this was surprising that such a huge deficit remains in a child. And what is the effect of chronic malnutrition? The child has been having chronic malnutrition earlier before coming to you. This will lead to persistent bone destruction. Your fasciotomies, your scoliosis wounds, large, will be non-healing wounds. Fasciotomies heal very precariously. There will be pus-pouring wounds also. Recurrent infections will occur. Osteomyelitis in one of our patients, Harsh, his name was Harsh, I suppose. His humerus osteomyelitis, he was from a good family. Humerus osteomyelitis, we used to operate, we used to debride, give him antibiotic according to the culture and everything. Few days down, he would come back with another incidence. Repeated infections, recurrent infections in the same bone indicated a chronic malnutrition. There's further sequestration of the bone. And mind you, one of the most serious complications of low immunity in a child is a hematogenous flat bone involvement. Some of these pictures will show our patients tubercular infections. They keep on lingering. Long bone osteomyelitis of tubercular nature, they'll keep on lingering. The sinus will not heal. Tuberculosis typically needs a whole lot of calories. The sequestration, which starts which starts as a small sequestrum sometimes will go persistently into a whole long bifacial osteomyelitis. And if I may remind you again, please remember this is not just the bone that is rotten, the whole hemopoietic system and the immunity contributed by a single tibia in a child is gone with this. This is all pus filled cavity. There are no hemopoietic cells there to defend. Tubercular osteomyelitis, long bone osteomyelitis, again, long sequestration, mixed infections, pyogenic infections, fibular osteomyelitis. Fibula is such a strong bone. Fibula is supposed to be very resistant to circulating infections. So if a child is getting fibular osteomyelitis, it indicates the child has a very poor resistance. Flat bone osteomyelitis, again, ileum osteomyelitis, capillary osteomyelitis indicates a very poor host because you would all agree with me, they are cancellous bones. They are not cortical bones to the extent of a femur or a tibia. And cancellous bones, as we see when we remove bone grafts from the ileum, they bleed so much. There's so much of vascularity in these bones that there should be nothing wrong for these bones to allow settling of circulating infections in that. However, when it happens, when you get an iliac osteomyelitis or a hematogenous scapular osteomyelitis, it's a very sick child. Child has been really sick all the time, sick in the sense he hasn't been having enough food for eating, for circulating his uh, into the, his hemopoietic system. And definitely hip joint and sacroiliac joint will be involved if you have an ileum osteomyelitis. So please remember, if we talk of metaphyseal uh, areas as the, as the beginning of osteomyelitis, there are many, many metaphyseal areas in the pelvis also. So if these are attacked, then definitely a very disastrous kind of osteomyelitis whole iliac blade can be involved. And this is one of the sickest child who has been having flat bone osteomyelitis. So what do we do? We modify our treatment protocols very slightly, but very effectively. For an OPD patient's family, ask them to maintain a meticulous diet diary. And you can calculate the calorie values of the, their available right, left, center on the net. For admitted patients, we asked our nursing staff to keep a diet diary, and it is very easy for the nursing staff to keep a diet diary. And to your surprise, if you follow this, especially for your admitted patients, you will be horrified how minimal intake is there. Children don't eat. We take a round, we look at the wound, we look at the splints, tractions, um, stitch lines, IV lines, antibiotic chelari, kinei chelari, painkiller, dia, kinei dia. Did you ever check what the child has eaten? No, we don't check, and we were horrified to see actually horrified to see when the nursing staff showed us the diet diary of an admitted child. So we calculate with the help of our hospital dietitian, the standard daily calorie intake for the age and sex, match it with the actual calories that the child is eating, calculate the nutritional deficit, add the healing 1.5 times the natural calorie and arrange to fulfill the deficit. And how to correct the deficit? We don't give huge adult meals to the admitted children, even after surgery, they don't eat at all. So what you do is you give small, frequent, rich snacks and sweet drinks. This is over and about the normal meals, not just this. But don't worry if the child doesn't eat chawal, rice or roti or sabji dal, they don't eat, no issues. Now, here I am to, to probably challenge the concepts of 
what is a nutritious nutritious food for a sick child we give them grapes we they give them pomegranate seeds we give them badam we give them something this and that which is traditionally supposed to be very very nutritious look here what all we get sugarcane juice 260 calories in 100 ml if the child eats drinks about 50 ml of this you already have 130 calories what stops them from eating all this there is nothing wrong this is all full of calories i was surprised in my fellowship in university of washington in post op a child was leaking on a popsicle and i said you allow them that yeah then they said there no you have no harm they can do it so this was biggest surprise i got in my fellowship in university of washington all these things which we as adults would avoid eating because they are so rich are so good for the child give a couple of toffees to the child the child keeps on sucking on to the toffee this is all sugar this is all calories that the child needs a poor child can have anything out of this this is available everywhere in our country in different forms in winter seasons you have this and it actually our study was actually done in winter so some good samaritan donated a few of these gajaks to our patients in the ward and it was uh, with our nursing sisters and they calculated the calorie deficits and children enjoyed having the revdi and the gajak so much you know okay some children do not eat sweets i know what's wrong with this this is also another calorie now the idea of nutritious food for us sick children has to be changed in any form whatever the child likes give them calories you avoid eating potato chips because you know they are fatting that means they has calorie in it it has fat in it so for a sick child he needs everything peanuts dried peanuts okay this is good nutrition for the child for you and me this is fattening we don't eat this for a fresh coconut freshly cut coconut piece we again calculate calculate calories for ourselves but for a child this is this is a huge uh, nutritional supplement which will help in in having vitamins also okay homemade food this child harsh which i was talking about we asked his parents to they were good family we asked them to give him halwa and he used to relish halwa so much if not halwa then we asked them to keep these nuts handy at home so he used to come and eat whenever he wanted to eat that all this should be made available to the sick child depending upon the social status of the child so all of you are going to question me so what about high protein diet sir calorie deficit corrects protein deficiencies in a secondary way calorie deficit correction tops the priority because i told you it's the immune system that needs more circulating glucose normal protein intake which the child has suffices if you have sufficient calories the protein will will make itself very uh, obvious or you can give a small supplement if at all you want but this is not my priority and please remember proteins need calories for digestion so calorie deficit has to be corrected before you start giving hpd and normal or a little additional amount of fat is also okay for the child this is the concoction we have been practicing both in us when i was in ucms and ems rishikesh both for a child of say about 5 to 6 years of age you have 100 to 150 ml that is half a glass of milk with make it rich 3 ts of sugar 1 ts of any kind of your protein supplement protein x powder or anything and 2 ts of ghee if at all possible and this concoction we used to give at 6 am 11 am and 6 pm so that the normal diet is not affected normal meal times are not affected and the child used to get all this concoction nutrition sometimes they used to put a raw egg also the dietitians used to make that concoction this works very well it gives the additional calories with the child having no additional issues with this diet now the micronutrient component has to be taken care of the hemoglobin levels have to be also Uh, achieved by dietary supplementation if you can but you can seek a pediatric opinion for a anemia for a long term treatment now another important thing for the child to heal faster is mobilize mobilize in wheelchair exposed to external let them go out of the hospital corridors let them go into the yards of the hospital this encourages the food intake they feel good bahar ja ke khana acha lagta hai when the child goes out and gets get something from the kiosk outside in there or has a glass of uh, any juice from there this adds to the calories that the child has been having and please send home the child from the hospital as quickly as possible they don't like staying in the hospital at all all of us know that what is the proof of this effectivity of treatment well you can check the hemoglobin it improves local tissue healing will be obvious if it is bone infection you can see the involucrum starts forming quickly 
soft tissue wounds will start healing faster. The bone will start healing. Pathological factors of infections will start healing faster and the child will be more happy, active and cooperative. Children are very, very objective. If they are, if they are okay, they are okay. If they are not okay, they are not okay. There is no supratentorial or psychological element in their illness. How about infection in neonates? Well, they cannot be given all these kind of food. So what do we do? If they are breastfed, babies give the mother all these things. Ask the mother to eat more sugar, more food, because she needs to be healthier for feeding the baby. And I'm not sure whether the pediatricians prefer having MVI in their drips or not, but infant and neonates definitely need a specialist strategy for nutrition improvement. And the mother is the key factor here. The immune system is different. It is still coming from maternal immunity. So that has to be taken care of by the pediatricians. So to summarize, whenever we are talking about a child's orthopedic illness, please take a general history of his diet and intake habits. The local sites are always treated by standard guidelines. There is, no, there is no controversy in that. We have lots of seminars on everything, every topic. We have textbooks quoting everything everywhere. But I would suggest that refrain from heroic reconstructions in bad quality infected bone. You're not a big surgeon unless the body is on your side for healing. And consider diet as important as an antibiotic. If you do not do this, then the healing is going to go down the drain, whatever surgery you do. So my carry home message to the audience is that please consider eating habits and intake as an indicator of immunity of a child every time you have an elective surgery planned or an infected wound that you are treating. Improve the immune response aggressively with diet modifications. No HPD, but HCD, pumping calories and antibiotics won't work without inherent body defense, which is the leukocyte, basically. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. Very nice, ma'am. Thank you very much. You have changed the perception. We usually write on the prescription high protein diet, high protein diet every time. This case, even in adults also, we write high protein diet. So, is there any questions from the panelists? They are welcome. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful presentation. I just loved it. Uh, I have just few questions. Uh, one is, ma'am, uh, when you have these, especially the flat bone osteomyelitis, uh, any specific workup you do for immunity of these children? Uh, if you or, have the facility, you can go for IgG, IgM estimations and see if they have congenital immunoglobinopathies or, or those kind of sophisticated investigations. But you know, I have worked all my life into government hospitals and this, the category of children you get in government hospital, government free hospitals, that itself is an indicator of poor nutrition. The socioeconomic status of the patient tells you the story that this is a hungry skeleton and that's why flat bone osteomyelitis is also. I think Dr. Rampriya would agree with me that uh, we have been seeing flat bone osteomyelitis. In fact, our residents are alert now that if a child has a funny kind of presentation, suspect of flat bone osteomyelitis if you're not finding anything else anywhere. And the second question is, uh, sometimes we uh, the presentations can be very similar to malignancy. I mean, uh, very yeah. rarely we yeah. do come across malignancy sure. and infection. Uh, so uh, any specific thing that we look into which we can differentiate? Well, um, Ewing sarcoma has been the most uh, deceptive kind of presentation and people have unfortunately incised and so-called drained Ewing sarcoma also. Um, the dictum that we follow in our department was that biopsy every infection and culture every tumor. Tissue diagnosis is the only thing. You have to have tissue diagnosis. Don't be jumpy about draining it. Just aspirate have tissue diagnosis and then decide what you are going to do. The necrosis in Ewing sarcoma looks like pus so many times. It looks like pus so many times. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Shubha, ma'am, uh, I had a question uh, for you. Any particular organism that you have seen which uh, predisposes the child to this kind of nutritional deficit? Is this, this more, what I mean to ask you, is this more common with uh, gram-positive organisms or gram-negative? 
uh, are the conventional staph aureus is the culprit everywhere it finds its way into the child's body so quickly and it just needs a little down immunity of a child and staph aureus is everywhere it ready to attack if the immunity is further down then occasionally we have also found uh, klebsiella and we have also found uh, some other uh, organisms rarely pseudomonas we have not had a, a hematogenous pseudomonas but superimposed pseudomonas definitely in very sick children you do get that also is ma'am is there any role of uh, uh, any specific vitamin like uh, nowadays we are seeing that vitamin c is very important in healing of soft tissue uh, in such situations where we can uh, increase the uh, healing potential of it yes sir micronutrients like i said have been important so uh, i would suggest even zinc zinc supplementation helps a lot vitamin c vitamin d zinc supplementation iron supplementation this is definitely very important but all said and done this will come over and above once your calorie deficit is corrected or simultaneously with it if at all thank you ma'am thank, thank you is so there much. any thank other you, other question from the panelist Arti had unmuted herself. She can perhaps go ahead and ask a question. Ma'am, I think you have uh, given us a uh, great information about the glucose and uh, the micronutrients. So we were always in a dilemma that uh, high protein diet, high protein diet, and uh, we didn't ask, we didn't ask uh, the child that what he has eaten in the morning, what he has eaten. So um, it's like all that uh, we have uh, given us the information. One thing I would like to ask you, but firstly, I would like to ask about the flat osteomyelitis. So in flat osteomyelitis, one even sharp coma. So is there any diet alteration, or it's just the same that uh, goes? Is there any thing that we can add up in um, tumor-like conditions or in osteomyelitis? Anything we can differentiate? Like I said, there are confusing situations, especially even sarcoma, and sometimes osteosarc also gives you a confusion between an infection and that too. The child with malignancy is very sick. The so is the child with uh, osteomyelitis also. So the confusion will remain, and that's my answer remains the same. Tissue diagnosis is something which you must have. Culture every tumor and biopsy every infection. It is normally we only go for the antibiotics, the treatment, and um, it was a good topic to you that uh, nutritional uh, things should be added, and so that um, it uh, hampers or um, uh, earlier we used to only the drive on the that antibiotic and first one opening, but uh, it's like um, eye opening to everybody that nutrition do help a um, very important role, but. Um, Socioeconomic status do also matter. So these things, um, I think that uh, give us uh, proper information uh, regarding that uh, the nutrition disorder in uh, bone joint infection. Because it's just an infection we always in our mind that we have only tuberculosis. It's only osteomyelitis. We treat, and there are so many disorders that uh, in infection we have in pediatrics. Uh, so. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. So thank you. Thank you. Another panel. Thank you. The any question? Thank you, madam. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, so we will. Uh, there is still some time, madam, for you. You will be joining the second discussion or not? Yeah, we can go ahead with the next discussion. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Rujita Mata, please share your screen. For your uh, decision making in Januaris and January. Thank you very much, Dinohi sir, and absolutely delighted to be following uh, uh, our inspiration, Shobha ma'am. So, well, Januarum and Januvalgum is again a very common condition in our country, almost uh, second to osteomyelitis. And a uh, lot of people are really stuck as to, you know, how should we assess, how should we watch it. 
what should we be uh, choosing as a method of treatment. So I'll just try to uh, give an overview and kind of share the journey the way I have learned to look at it now. Uh, can we have everybody else's microphones open? So let's look at the etiology. Most of us know that majority of our cases either will be falling into the first groups, physiologic or rickets, and uh, uh, largely nutritional and which is a huge problem in our country like madam has so beautifully elaborated and other varieties we must not forget that rickets is not just nutrition sometimes we do get a lot of other varieties which may cause these angular deformities blounts or tibia vara not so common in our country however it is still uh, uh, pretty much high on the list nowadays in urban population because of the uh, over uh, feeding syndrome in the very rich kids and other syndromes which are very much known, these are in fact these need attention throughout and I think they largely go undiagnosed and by the time they travel to many centers and finally come to the tertiary reference, again we find that deformities which could have been treated easily end up being uh, more difficult modalities. And very, very clearly what Madam said in her lecture uh, that post septic and post osteomyelitis physical arrests and all do happen. And we pay such little attention to uh, prevention of that also, that that also finally comes up as a either a genuvarum or a genuvalgum, or legs or knockies. And these deformities, mind you, are pretty complicated. Besides the standard management, you will need to address the other components uh, like the shortening and uh, various other malformations. But mind you, unless you correct the angular deformity, you cannot go ahead with the other reconstruction. And then, of course, the post-traumatic cerebral palsy and GIA, just to complete the list of etiologies, which are uh, common. So how will you look at them? First and foremost, you have to define where lies the deformity. Is it largely in the fem femur or is it largely in the tibia? Or is it both? Then you will look at the intercondylar and intermalleolar distances. Again, this is something which has been taught to almost every orthopedic surgeon and every pediatrician as something like a, a you know gold standard. But mind you, these are not gold standards. Evaluating a deformity has many other components which we look at. So suffice to say at this juncture that these are merely clinical guides which tell you whether the deformity is progressing or not progressing. And they tell you whether the deformity is a bow legs or a knock knees. This should not become the hallmark because these are loose measurements which we uh, measure. In cases of where you want to differentiate between physiological or pathological genuvarum genuvalgum, you can always do a cover test as I'll show in subsequent slides in the younger age groups. Then if you have a genuvalgum, uh, you are at a risk of the patella subluxing. So please always look for a kissing patella sign if it's a bilateral case or a squint patella in a unilateral case and make sure to check your patella tracking because long-standing deformities lead to patella subluxation. Along with that, don't forget to look at the gait of the child and associated problems, especially ligament laxity, because you will have to factor that in when you plan your correction and overcorrect so that at the end of the uh, correction, your clinically, it doesn't uh, look as if it's inadequate. And how much is the deformity? First, when you've defined everything else, then you want to look at the, how much exactly is the deformity because that is what is going to give you your surgical plan. So there, radiological measurements are the absolute paramount uh, correct uh, assessment is needed over here. And you, of course, need to see whether it is uniplanar or multiplanar. In the same bone also, sometimes you have multi-apical deformities or multi-planar deformities in some very complex cases. There, you will need to put together clinical and radiological factors before deciding and planning preoperatively what you're going to go ahead and do. Yeah, so just to show you quickly that many things are complex and take life always with a little pinch of salt. Let's look at some clinical examples. I harped upon the fact that intercondylar distance is something you take. Now look at this child. When you look at the intercondylar distance with this kind of, uh, you know, kind of thigh fold, sometimes you may not perform the thing at an accurate bony point. So therefore, what is actually true will be the radiological intercondylar distance. But if this deformity was very severe, it will be practically impossible for you to get it on the same plate. Hence, remember that if this goes on decreasing, that is a good sign. And that is what you will use to monitor just as a clinical guide. Again, intermalleolar distance. Again, this has a fallacy. If the patella are not facing forward, 
you may get a wrong measurement on this. So for example, in supine versus standing, there is a huge difference. Here again, the ligament laxity also has a lot of uh, things to play. So what you really need to uh, do is for a rough judgment in your OPD, whether this is progressing or is it worsening on standing and how bad is it? Will you be able to get the uh, entire lower limb into one plane or on one X-ray for a film? Let's look at the younger children and discover what is a McEwen's test or the cover test next. Look at it for McEwen's test in uh, tibia vara, especially where you want to see where and how much lies the deformity by asking the child to lie down and folding up his knees. And there you have to be absolutely sure that this is not femoral. And if it is, if the deformity worsens, it is in the tibia. If it, deformity improves and the tibia is straight, then the deformity is in the femur. Again, performing the McEwen's test in the genu valgum. Here you can see on performing the test, the tibia is absolutely straight. So this entire grotesque deformity which the parents notice here actually lies in the femur. So this is the importance of doing both these tests. Then also do the Alice's test, which is the uh, different levels of the uh, knee joint. This is especially important in cases of unilateral and complex deformities. Here you can clearly see one knee is lower than the other. So you should be on the lookout for associated problems like this child had a hemisacral agenesis and a shortening as well as the angular deformity. The patella tracking, like I said, this is a squint patella. And in a very long standing case, this is a totally dislocating patella. So clinical evaluation is never complete in a genu valgum without assessing the patella. Having clinically evaluated, you need to know when not to intervene and when to intervene. So this is a classical example of when not to intervene. When you have a 15 month old child presenting with an apparently gross looking deformity and very worried parents, all you need to do and assure them is that this is the physiological selenius and vanka curves where it is the lower edge of the, um, the proximal tibia is actually in valgus, not in varus, which I'll show you how to decipher in a cover test. And this is slowly going to over the next few years, almost up to the age of four to six years, go uh, the reverse way from a varum into a valgum and then eventually straighten out at the end of this, the same child who was perfectly normal without any intervention at the age of four years. So how will we perform the cover test? Look at this deformity, a unilateral tibia vara, and this apparently gross looking bilateral tibia vara. This is still falling within the progression of this is with the Selenius Vanka chart that I spoke about. When you cover the lower half, and then you look at the proximal tibia, this is perfectly in a physiological valgus, whereas this is in a true varus. So this is a pathological deformity and this needs correction. This, when you cover, you can see that both the proximal tibia are in a typical valgus there. And this falls in the uh, physiological curve. This does not need any intervention. When we speak about intervention, it's never isolated in uh, genu valgum and varum. It is always a medical plus surgical management. So you must identify the underlying metabolic bone disease. If it is a nutritional rickets, correct the bio biochemical parameters and definitely correct the calorie as well as the protein deficit because calcium and protein have a same common carrier and they go hand in hand into the bloodstream. Correcting that often allows spontaneous correction and you intervene only if this fails. So this is an X-ray showing you all the classical uh, splaying, fraying, cupping of the epiphysis and thin pencil cortexes and all. Remember in our country, vitamin C and vitamin D uh, deficits are commonly occurring together, which is known as Barton's disease. So don't just give them calcium and vitamin D and high calorie diet, also supplement with vitamin C. When will you intervene surgically? If you have a deformity persisting beyond the physiological age, for example, in this child beyond six years of age, classical rickets and a significant deformity. You will do medical management as well as surgical management here. We'll quickly look at in the next few slides how. Or if the deformity exceeds the normal range. This child is four, but she has a very, very gross tibia vara, almost an O-shaped deformity. This radiograph was not possible on the same film. We had to take individually one, one limb on the scanogram and then stitch it together digitally. So when you have these kind of uh, uh, problems in the physiological or, no, uh, or you know, beyond the spectrum range, that is when you intervene surgically. Again, similar O deformity, bigger child untreated for so many years because she had underlying hypophosphatemia, which was never identified. 
vitamin D, vitamin D, they kept on giving and uh, the problem was something else totally. So this, she had to be treated medically and then subjected to osteotomy. It will come in a few times. Or if you have a resistant rickets like this, here they have done the correct uh, intervention surgically, but they fail to recognize that this was a resistant rickets. So goes to say that hand in hand, you must treat both the components simultaneously and identify correctly, which is the type of deficiency here. This is obvious. This is a sick physis. This is a classical blounts or a tibia vara. You will intervene definitely here because this physis, which is suppressed, depressed, and also uh, even the joint starts uh, uh, dipping down, like as you see over here, this will never heal by itself. You will have to intervene in a multi-complex surgery form. We'll look at it shortly. If there's a skeletal dysplasia, like it is obvious over here, which is affecting the entire skeleton and also causing an angular deformity, Again, you will intervene surgically. So how will you intervene medically is what we'll look at. And then how will you intervene surgically, which is what all of us are interested in. So I won't elaborate too much on these slides, but suffice to say that there's a whole list of investigations which must be done. And in young children, it's all, always best to draw all the blood together and urine samples together so that you don't miss uh, resistant rickets, especially if it's a unilateral case, if it's a boy, and if it's uh, something which has, despite, uh, because vitamin calcium and vitamin D are the most commonly abused drugs, despite roaming around to three, four practitioners, if it has still not healed, then your antenna must go up and you must do all these investigations and ensure adequate dosing. Overtreatment sometimes can be harmful. This was a case where a physiological genuvarum had been given so much vitamin D, it was about 104 or 106 nano units when I saw the child. And you can easily make this out actually on an X-ray. You don't even need a blood test. When you see this very deep white line, this is a classical hypervitaminosis, also makes the child very cranky, irritable, and sometimes it causes pseudo tumor cerebri. So all these supplements also should be given with a lot of care and only after the correct investigation. Now let's come to the part that's most important to us. The X-rays, of course, are gold standard in evaluating an angular deformity. One is to confirm the etiology and then to plan the management. For planning the management, nothing can substitute a good alignment view. And we'll talk about the malalignment test quickly. Other imaging modalities do exist in complex situations, CT and MRI, but we'll talk about them only in some things. What is important here is that a weight bearing alignment view right from the pelvis to the ankles full length is very, very important with a square pelvis. It is not a scanogram because we are not looking at length measurements here. What we are looking is that the patella should be facing forward. It should be a large film or a digital X-ray. And you should be able to judge the anatomical axis and the mechanical axis. Of course, that's a lecture in itself. Uh, you know, maybe somebody like Mangal or uh, Milind or Ruta can take it. But what, what I want to stress upon is that please ignore the position of the feet here. The first four or five parameters are very, very important. If you try to correct the position of the feet, you will miss the patella facing forward and all your angles will go wrong. And after you have ensured that this is a standard quality check of the uh, x-rays complete, then you perform a malalignment test. So let's look at some quick clinical examples to prove it. This is a seemingly very uh, subtle deformity uh, when you see over here, but when you check whether the patella facing forward, they were facing grossly outward. And when she was, Put again with the patella facing forward. This was the actual magnitude of the deformity. And that's the X-ray, which was taken in supine position. And therefore, it never revealed this. This was, of course, a bigger child. And she was too late for growth modulation. But again, similar example in a genuvalgum. People tend to take a supine X-ray and say, hardly any deformity here, just very little in the femur. And when an actual alignment view was taken with the patella facing forward, see how large the deformity was and how asymmetric it was, especially in one of the legs. And that's the child clinically to show you. So what is this malalignment test? Make sure that the centers of the hip, knee and ankle are all in one line. Draw your joint orientation lines, then draw the mechanical axis of the femur and the tibia. And then you'll get your most important LDFAs and MPTAs. This needs a much more detailed lecture later. But this will tell you how much of correction you're going to need, how long it's going to take to correct if it's a growth modulation, if it's an osteotomy, it will give you the exact magnitude of the edge and tell you also about fixation. So since we've already now touched upon the subject of fixation very quickly, many, many methods to correct the deformities, growth modulation in the younger age groups, 
pets more towards the uh, maturing or in special situations. Osteotomy is in uh, age groups where growth modulation will not work. Complex deformities, of course, sometimes require combinations. And all the uh, form, uh, you know, principles of deformity correction have to be followed. Sometimes you have to literally plan it out whether everything is possible at a single stage or whether you're going to need many stages in the same deformity and then indulge in a limb lengthening. So growth modulation, as most of you know, are extra periosteal tension uh, bands or you know, pegs, which you would call it. They are very well known to mankind in the earlier ages. They were, uh, you know, years they were using staples. Now they use a uh, two titanium screws and an extra periosteal plate, which is shaped like the eight, and therefore it's called eight plate, which allows for a little toggle. It allows for an opening up. When you insert them, you have to insert them parallel. And as we'll see in the subsequent slides, over a period of time, when you band the overgrowing epiphysis and allow a few months or years to go by, this is the kind of uh, opening up that you will get on the opposite side. And that is how gradually the deformity corrects and aligns itself. It can be easily done by anybody in any setup, be it a surgical, I mean, in a small nursing home or a university setup or even a private practice. All you need is a few implants like these, few pairs of eight plates, uh, locating K wires, cannulated uh, drill and screwdriver system. And it's almost like a daycare surgery. So mark your physis on table, pass your uh, plates on top after a slight soft tissue dissection. Make sure that your guide wires are parallel and then insert your plates over it. And it's like a half an hour surgery and gives great results. These are the rates of correction that you will see. A uh, femur approximately at 0.7 per month, 0.5 degrees in the tibia. So when you need more degrees of correction, you may occasionally combine that. This comes a little bit with a trial and error, but it tends to do very well if you have the patience to do it. You counsel your uh, parents of the child uh, properly. And you've also kept the skeletal age in mind. So please remember in boys and girls who are nearing skeletal maturity uh, around eight or 10, you have to look at both bone age and uh, you know, the chronological age. This is a Suvagrain's chart, which gives you the ossification centers of each of these four epiphyses. It's easily done by a you know, quick two minute X-ray in the OPD. All you have to look at is a maturation of the olecranon and a minimum four physis to be open on uh, your AP X-ray which in clinical language translates to that you have minimum two years of growth left. And therefore, the time that you require to execute the correction by the gradual growth modulation is still there with you. Quick clinical examples, five-year-old boy, severe genuvalgum, varum, sorry, treated by eight plates successfully, and that's him at the end of one and a half months, one and a half years, I'm sorry. A genuvalgum in a bigger eight, ten-year-old girl, bilateral idiopathic again, treated successfully with uh, eight plates, and that's her full correction in 14 months. No method, however attractive it looks, is devoid of complications. So this is the list of complications you must always remember that uh, it's more technique related sometimes and patient related. So before you embark on this journey, very, very important to tell all the parents that you have to come back every three months for serial x-rays. If any problem is found like a screw backing out or the screw is not opening up, in cases of girls, if they start becoming menarchal, you may either have to add uh, another a growth modulation or you may have to resort to osteotomies. One such example, see how powerful the deforming forces and the physis can be. This was that very severe O deformity child. She was treated as a four-year-old with growth modulation, lost to follow up classically, came back with reverse deformities where we pulled this out and then we exchange that eight plate and put it on the lateral side of the tibia. And at the end of the whole correction, this is how well she corrected with the same methodology. You can sometimes get under correction if you're a little late in applying this. For example, this child had to be given an osteotomy and he failed and that's how a nice correction we got with an osteotomy. So when we proceed, talk about osteotomies, there are again, same principles to be followed. Identify the cora, find out where it is, Resolve it to a single cora if the deformity is less than 10%. If it's a multi or apical deformity, you may need multiple levels. We won't go too much into details of all this. But I think this is known to most orthopedic surgeons just to enlist the uh, principles of deformity correction here that we must follow. Many techniques, uh, still a lot of old timers uh, 
use pins and plasters absolutely nothing wrong in it except that uh, in the urban setup a lot of parents don't accept it and therefore plates and screws have come into vogue because you can uh, you know mobilize them faster nowadays people do external fix it fixator assisted nails and plates as well so this was a 15 year old child who i told you in the earlier uh, very earlier slides for the malalignment test and that was his deformity which had to be treated by a close wedge osteotomy and this is the excellent correction that we got remember to de rotate in such children at the tibia also because when you do this evaluation you can see that the uh, uh, child is significantly in toeing so that is his correction after doing femoral as well as tibial osteotomies this was done with pins and plasters again another child done with pins and plasters hypophosphatemic rickets metabolic problem treated well these pins backed out but the child went on to do extremely well this was a trial with cerebral palsy where we did not want to use pins and plasters because we were not sure how compliant they would be and this was treated with a clover leaf plate this has done extremely well and yet another medial side plating which nowadays we have started doing um this is of course a lateral plating this gives a very ghastly scar and sometimes you have a bump there medially so nowadays we've switched to medial plating where the scar also gets hidden in the thigh especially in girls coming to quickly some special situations like blounds this see these kind of cases you would want to uh, find out the magnitude of the plateau depression and also see what is there how much cartilage is lost so here you may use ct scans and a 3d planning which will give you exactly how badly the medial condyle is squashed so what you have to do is go in here and use a plateau elevating uh, osteotomy which goes almost right into the joint so in addition to the ct scan we also used an arthrogram on table to show us where and how much to elevate and get the joint line parallel and plus we added a growth modulation on the lateral side this was a bone graft and the plateau elevating osteotomy and this went on to heal beautifully and the child corrected extremely well so in complex situations like this you have to add both these methods together again another quick example a 13 year old child with a fixator guided uh, osteotomy and lengthening which was done at the same stage another 14 year old child now she's uh, now she's, sorry the same girl is now 14 years old she's 5 years post op and full equalization and uh, she's done well this is a very complex case of a post osteomyelitic physial arrest where you have also the loss of the posterior medial femoral condyles so you can see how bad this deformity is and there is no one stop shop possible in this and you had a very you know kind of uh, procovatum deformity as well so here we chose to do a simple osteotomy first get the range restored added a lateral uh, hemi epiphyseo uh, permanent hemi uh, sorry permanent epiphysiodesis and after the osteotomy united now we will be proceeding with a lengthening on that side at the moment the child is on a shoe raise so in summary you need to differentiate each case as per the etiology and plan accordingly quantify the deformity and qualify the deformity both what all is associated with it and how much it is do your relevant medical tests and simultaneous medical treatment otherwise your surgical correction will fail in younger ages growth modulation is a very powerful tool but you require a strict follow up and there are some caveats as to uh, when not to apply them or combine them with osteotomies and plan your osteotomies after performing the malalignment test with a full length x ray and use imaging only in special conditions uh, you can also address the torsional problems to be factored in and stage treatment in very complex cases does work so at the end of the day what i would say is that this is where the true joy of orthopedics is orthos and pedos the word itself has come from deformity correction in children so this is a huge subject but i've tried to bring it uh, together in a nutshell and i think all pediatric orthopedic surgeons feel very very happy when you do these kind of deformities correct i welcome you. thank you madam rukta Uh, it was a vast subject, and you went in an express way. Yes, uh, I had to. Uh, people uh, must have missed a lot of things because uh, being so vast subject, everything is can not be told. But uh, I am sure that it will come in the question answer session. So I would request the all the panelists to. 
please uh, fill up the blanks where they feel that uh, something has to be told more in a comprehensive manner. May I start, ma'am? Yeah, hi, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Excellent talk, lovely examples. A uh, few questions that I had in mind or as, as a common orthopedic practitioner or my colleagues are, when they talk about bracing for genuvalgum and genuvalgum, especially uh, genuvalgum, uh, they'll come at four years, though we know it is physiological, they'll say, is there a brace which is available? Should we brace, should not, uh, when should we brace? I mean, are there any one or two examples where we can brace, like blouts do we brace? Or we don't normally brace children because we know that they may not correct the deformity. Yeah, so uh, excellent point, Saraswati. I think bracing is by and large out of the armamentarium unless you have a lot of ligament laxity or you're going to use it as a time buying before you do some definitive management. But the bracing, if you're using them, you have to use them with caveats. You have to explain to the parents that uh, you need to have the braces on all day long. It's only when the child is weight bearing that the three point measurements are uh, or correction or when you try to pull it the other way. It is what tends to happen with young children, especially the younger they are, the more playful they are. No child likes to be tied tightly right from the thigh, it's right to the ankle. So you end up throwing it and then the parents more as a psychological comfort, then they tie the child up in the night. So that is just it's a victim and therefore my large is enough, but, but yeah, very lax children or as a time time measure to correct the metabolic parameters. If the, they are very keen, you could use the routine genu arum valgum physiological, I would not advise it at all. Sir, Rampri has a question. Yes. Good evening, ma'am. Nice talk, ma'am. Uh, ma I have a doubt. Uh, is it wise to uh, do over correction in order to get the reverse phenomenon? Yeah, that was something purposely I left behind because, uh, you know, otherwise it will just become all about growth modulation the whole talk. So growth modulation, classically, the younger you do it and the more number of years that the child has left to grow, there is a definite risk and therefore they say you have to correct at least 5% beyond zone 2. So, for example, if you have a genu arm of 23 degrees and you do growth modulation, when you are leaving the eight plates in, you will definitely leave them for at least two years and then a two, three months four. So try and get the deformity to uh, the genu varum to come to a physiological genu valgum of five degrees. So 23 plus five, you will need 27 degrees correction when you uh, do that. So that by the time the child is 14, he doesn't have a recurrence of the genu varum all over it. But it is not true that in every case we will get rebound phenomenon. Yeah, if you're doing it at around 10 years or so, and if it's a girl child, by the time you finish, sometimes they become minarchal even before. So, the later age group, you're not too uh, always overcorrect. But 3 to 5 degrees as a rough rule of the thumb is a great idea. But the younger the child, you must overcorrect. And th that too with counseling of the parents, because the uh, parents get terribly worried that now it's becoming the opposite deformity. So you have to tell them that, no, we will pull out the eight plate as soon as uh, we feel that now three to five degrees of overcorrection has happened. Thank you. Ma'am, what are the indication of double level growth modulations? If you have, the great question again, if you have less number of uh, years left, and if you have a large deformity, Say you have a 20 25 degree femur, which would be very large, and another 10 15 degrees the tibia. If you were to do only the femur, although the large part majority of your deformity is in the femur, if you were to you know do that, you will require almost four to five years. Like he just even recommends in skeletal dysplasia that do femur and tibia and then wait beyond the normal period of two years. So if you have a large degree. Or if you have a child who is almost going to approach skeletal maturity and still some of your electron fibers is open, you have less time, but again a low, uh, low amount of the, uh, deformity. So depending on, once you're well versed with growth modulation, you can play around with it. This is a very large uh, genu valgum. I will 100% say, please do your femur and tibia together. Otherwise, you 
will end up, the patella will surely end up subluxating. And if you have a genu varam, then that is a little less forgiving. Uh, but there again, you may use a primatidia combination if the child was almost 10, 11 years old, especially if it was a boy. Thank you, ma'am. Madam, when there is torsional deformity, you have to go through osteotomy only or any other thing? So if it's a torsional deformity beyond 10, 15 degrees, where the child is so significantly in toed, in towing is a very disabling gait. The child cannot mm -hmm. propel himself forward. And out towing is a very stable gait. So there, if you have a multi apical deformity and you're correcting, uh, say, with an osteotomy of the femur, and at the end of it, the femur looks straight, but the child still is pointing inwards, then the parents are going to be very, very unhappy with you, even though the tibia is and femur are radiologically straight. So there, you have to de rotate a little bit. But if he's out toed, then maybe you could wait for some time and uh, especially your foot progression angles are not beyond 10 15 degrees. You could wait and uh, try and try with physiotherapy and try to make. So, uh, ma'am, uh, what's the level of osteotomy in these cases? At which then, the, we... then the derotation osteotomy will be supramalleolar in the tibia. Supramalleolar. But the uh, main correction will be again supracondylar in the femur. Oh. So many times in uh, valgus, uh, genu valgum, uh, kids, we are saying that the foot is in plano valgus now. Oh. So there I is there... leave them alone. Okay. Because just having a supple plano valgus teeth is uh, more of treating the parent rather than the child. I did not bother you running around, jumping, playing football. Doing it. And it's a triad. If you have ligament laxity and a planovalgus foot and a mild genovalgum, then it's all just in the physiological way. But if it goes beyond a certain age, yeah, then do the osteotomy and put them on physio for the planovalgum. If it's a cerebral palsy child, yeah, then you will need SMOs, AFOs, things like that. So it's like a lot of decision making is clinical and in the, on your pre op planning. Ma'am, can I ask a question regarding Blount's disease? Uh, before the plateau, uh, uh, this thing, uh, depression, just the eight plates, do they work that well? Or because the physis is, the opposite physis is not growing at all. So whoa, is there any uh, role of just the eight plate to keep the deformity corrected and then maybe lengthening later or something? Or what is? Yeah, so eight plates for a langan skewed one or two are uh, still recommended, but with a very close follow-up. Again, the younger the child, there is, you can't go ahead and do your osteotomy, say if you have a six-year-old uh, blounds, then you know that he's going to require a plateau elevating osteotomy, but at least it will prevent some amount of the depression from the plateau coming too flat. First two stages, yes, but beyond Langenskjold 3, there is just no point in using only growth modeling. There, even if the child is young, you will have your plateau elevation osteotomy, lateral epithelial, uh, bone graft, the medial tibia, uh, do a fibulotomy as well, and even ablate the physis of the fibula. Because every possible so on the lateral side you want to ablate. Yes. So it looks like I think we've really stirred up a, a whole lot of questions about it. But this is one of those topics I think it's best, best to take it case by case. Uh, all I will say is that if you really do a detailed clinical evaluation and a proper pre-op planning, and I see no harm. There are a lot of surgeons nowadays who say that we want to do bilateral cases together. But I personally see no harm in doing one leg at a time because I think when the surgeon is fatigued, and doing two os complex osteotomies on the same day, one is uh, you may not really get exactly symmetrical correction. If you stage out your surgery, you will actually be able to adjust if there is any uh, angle uh, required. And second is that, uh, you know, ch lesser chance of infection if you are not doing both of the things. Bilateral TKRs may be passion, but I think bilateral genuvalgum correction, I'm still not... Okay. And regarding the medial osteotomy, the surgical correction, 
Shin, you said these days you prefer medial osteotomy because uh, the uh, incision is uh, more cosmetically accepted. The bump yeah. is not there. Uh, the precautions that we take because of the femoral artery going down. I mean, what is the precautions? Or what are the surgical steps that you will give are important when you are operating medially, approaching medially? If you do a vascular sparing approach, then automatically that takes away your uh, important neurovascular structures. Just like you do it for a, a DKR, a partner's approach. Okay. And you use a, nowadays you get those short uh, distance femur uh, plates, which is you know, the UMA and AO makes it and uh, even UMA Universal, all of them give it. So you get your four screws in the condyle itself. And now you're not worried about the epiphysis. So once you have that distal hold good, you can use a short three hold plate as well. If you're not detecting too much up, again your hunters can ask you. Yes. yes. Okay. And it is your close wedge, so no bleeding, hardly any suction tube required. It does very well, especially girls, I think are happier with nowadays girls who wear shorts also, so they don't like the lateral scars too so. Anything else to be discussed? Dr. Rama? No, sir. I'm done. Nothing, sir. Dr. I think Pali. the important point ma'am said is sometimes we treat patients I, and parents. Most of the times, I think uh, pediatric orthopedics, especially when the physiological deformity comes, most of the times we have to tell patient parents that, no, your child is normal, your child is normal. Uh, they keep they'll go to 10 pediatricians and then come to you and then you know that becomes very important that we connect and talk to them uh, so how often i'm um, just a simple question how often when we know it is physiological uh, sometimes parents are not convinced so how often do we call them just to say uh, it usually takes about a year to get corrected yeah so, so within like a year they may go to four uh, uh, doctors they will go to all the pediatric orthopedics in an, in the city and then come back to you so uh, how do we deal with such parents? Any, yeah. any tricks? Yeah, yeah, very, very important tip, which I think I've learned the hard way myself, is you have to keep these parents. Okay, so you must understand that their uh, anxiety or their worry about till they keep seeing that every day, and especially if it's a significant genuarum and you have a nice stubby little child, and unless you give them a task to do, they will definitely seek more and more opinions. So what I tell them is that I make it like a big, uh, you know, important duty on their shoulders. And I tell them that please pick up a tile or something, select in your house a fixed area where you will measure the child every month with state and maintain a diary. And I in the clinic, I show them exactly how to make the child stand, keep the patella facing forward. And I tell them that this tile ke under, most children's um, parents have a tiled house or whatever. But in this dimension, if the child's foot is staying within this dimension and keep noting it on a fixed place, then be happy. If it starts falling out of that tile, that means the deformity is definitely changing. And then you need to come and see me. If this is not happening over the next three months, then rest assured that everything is going to be fine by the end of nine months. And follow up, I always insist on a three monthly follow up so that we can. Yeah, one thing I would uh, caution you is most people tend to take to the next day. So, as long as you're sure that this is physiological, there is no need to take an x ray at every follow up. But a clinical measurement and a clinical quantification of the thing is very important. And first come to work, you can uh, advise them some exercises. The more the skeleton is stimulated, the faster the growth. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, I uh, do two things. I tell them to come every month so that I take the measurements every month. And Correct. second thing is for a Janu Varam uh, case, I tell them that uh, they, they should uh, go from down to upwards from the lateral sides yeah. many times a day. So the mother is busy giving uh, the child a uh, little yeah. massage from. Uh, below upwards so th correct. that works also correct correct very very true same philosophy words of experience from a senior mentor dr punit anything to add nothing sir nothing so i would request dr punit 
to give a formal uh, vote of thanks from the Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association. Thank you, Rujita, ma'am. आप हमेशा हम लोगों के इनविटेशन पे आते हैं थैंक्स ए लॉर्ड शुभ मैम इज नॉट हेयर एंड थैंक्स टू अवर पैनलिस्ट डॉक्टर सरस्वती डॉक्टर आरती डॉक्टर रमा प्रिया एंड थैंक्स रोहित सर थैंक्स टू ऑर्थो टीवी थैंक्स पूनम थैंक्स डॉक्टर अशोक श्याम सर थैंक्स टू अवर डेलीगेट्स थैंक यू मैम हैव अ गुड नाइट थैंक यू टू ऑर्थो टीवी एंड देव भूमि उत्तरांचल एंड थैंक यू माय गर्ल एंड सिरोही सर ग्रेट कांग्रेचुलेशंस एंड पुनीत ऑल ओवर अगेन फॉर होल्डिंग अ डाइवर्सिटी webinar thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you bye bye thank you thank you ma'am namaskar thank you